Um, so this is, uh, there are typically different um, requirements that drive uh, these types of methods. Um, so there are requirements that come from different challenges um, that phase one studies uh, are associated with, but there are also ethical requirements. Um, so this paper here by Thol and Lee uh, stressed the fact that you need to, uh, to expose as few subjects as possible to the most uh, toxic doses and as many as possible uh, to dose levels that are close to the target toxicity level without uh, overtaking it. Uh, historically, they have been, this has been a subject uh, that has um, taken uh, quite a few hours in conferences, especially like in, in, in London, there is a conference that takes place once a year. It's around uh, this, uh, this time of year. I think it's towards the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, it's, it's run by SMI uh, in adaptive designs. And usually within that conference, there's always going to be a talk that is going to go through these types of methods. Uh, this slide is actually taken from one of these talks uh, from uh, Alessandro Matano in uh, Novartis, um, where, where, where they, they list the different challenges associated with phase one trials and the different design requirements. So once again, uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to accurately estimate the MTD, avoid as much as possible overdosing subjects, uh, avoid also as much as possible subtherapeutic sub doses uh, while controlling overdosing, uh, enroll more patients at acceptable doses, and use information efficiently. And if possible, use all the information that you have available at your disposal uh, efficiently. And I'm saying all information because as you will see, uh, the, the method that it's currently being used most, um, the 3 plus 3 method, will only use information from the last two cohorts of subjects, ignoring thus what has happened up to that point in the trial. So typically, the, the methods that are being used are categorized in rule-based methods, like the 3 plus 3 design or different up and down types of designs, uh, model-based methods, like the continual reassessment method and the uh, um, Bayesian logistic regression model. Uh, and there has also been like a hybrid methodology uh, which uh, uses sort of like the merits of an algorithm of a rule-based design in the sense that it's pretty easy for clinicians to implement and understand, uh, but it also utilizes uh, Bayesian uh, approaches to model the probabilities of toxicities at each dose level. And in particular, they use indeed uh, like uh, in the pipe approach that uh, Adrian uh, this, uh, demonstrated, it uses independent beta. Uh, uh, distributions for these probabilities of toxicities. So um, with these model-based approaches, uh, the, the difference between and uh, how what the difference between the rule-based and the model-based approaches has also been explored and presented uh, probably to death in all these uh, types of conferences. Um, I am a little bit biased. I would uh, uh, go towards model-based approaches because I find them more flexible. They utilize different cohort sizes. Uh, they utilize Bayesian statistical inference, which is naturally the, the, the way that we naturally tend to think. So you have some prior information, maybe some a priori view about the state of nature. You have data come in, and this will update your information. And you'll have an updated information. And that's, I, I find it pretty appealing. But uh, model-based approaches are typically more complex, so they need uh, the utilization of more uh, user-friendly software, which is something that we also tried uh, to bring. Um, I will quickly mention the 3 plus 3 design because it's the most prevalent one. Uh, just as an illustration in a review that was done uh, of uh, uh, 1,235 trials between 91 and 2006, which were designed to find a maximum tolerated dose, 1,215 of them used some sort of an up and down method like a 3 plus 3 design. So over 98% uh, of trials used that approach. And this is a trend that continued. Uh, there was another review a couple of years later. And the way that the 3 plus 3 design works, most of you are uh, familiar with it, uh, you, you enter subjects in cohorts uh, of three. If you observe no dose limiting toxicities, you would escalate to the NOx dose level. If you observe one limit dose limit toxicity out of three, you would add three more subjects at that dose level. If you have more than one, you either stop the trial or de-escalate. 
and you would evolve the algorithm like this. And there are sort of like a couple of different versions of the 3 plus 3 design, depending on whether you want to use a more conservative or a less conservative approach. And they mostly have to do with how they deal with what happens when you have one, sub, one DLT out of six subjects in the last set of two cohorts of subjects that you have. Uh, so the most conservative approach would stop the trial and could declare that dose as the MPD. The least conservative approach would escalate. Um, we have also added, so in, in the early version of the implementation of the 3 plus 3 software within EAST, we, have, we also use these two uh, variations of the 3 plus 3 design. We have also added recently uh, a modified version uh, of the 3 plus 3 low uh, approach, which uh, I will show later on. Along with all the presentations that I mentioned before in all the conferences that um, uh, take place, like the SMI conference, uh, there is usually one that will trash the 3 plus 3 design. That would be the, the standard one. So here's sort of like a compilation of the different ways to trash the design. So these were different types of criticism that were mentioned. Uh, for example, the one that I also mentioned before, it ignores the dosage creek history other than the previous cohort. So you're only going to be basing your conclusion on what happened on the previous cohort and oops, move away from it, and on the last cohort. And so you're not utilizing all the data that is available. Uh, other um, criticisms have to do with the fact that it ignores uncertainty. You cannot re-escalate once you have de-escalated. Um, and through different simulation studies, uh, Thol et al., for example, have shown that it has a low probability of selecting the true MTD, which is pretty important, and that there is a high variability among the MTD estimates. Um, also, as Adrian mentioned, there is no fixed target toxicity level with the 3 plus 3 uh, design. But there is an implicit one. When people are using the 3 plus 3 design, typically the, the terms 1 out of 3 and 1 out of 6 toxicities uh, come into mind. So there is a false sense that the target toxicity level is either 17% or 33%, um, which, again, is not true at all. Uh, so here at all in a simulation study has shown that actually the expected toxicity level at the MTD, when the 3 plus 3 design, is somewhere between 19 and 22%. And this is actually now with the uh, power of E some, something that you can uh, recreate uh, yourselves uh, pretty easily and, and see that indeed uh, this is the case. So lots of criticisms. Um, the regulators have also taken notice of this. Um, and as you can see here in the FDA guidance for therapeutic cancer vaccines, they have mentioned that the 3 plus 3 design may not be the most suitable approach. And other designs, such as accelerated titration or continuous reassessment, may be considered instead. The Europeans have also taken notice as well. And they have mentioned that designs like the continual reassessment methods uh, treat more patients at the optimum dose, uh, find the optimum dose quicker, and they estimate the optimum dose more accurately. And such methods are encouraged. So model-based approaches, which is what's coming up next, is something that the regulators have also encouraged in using. And model-based approaches utilize the Bayesian paradigm, as I mentioned. And within the Bayesian paradigm, you have some a priori information which may be available in terms of information from previous historical trials, information they can elicit from publications or from expert opinion. You can synthesize this information and form what is called the prior distribution. Then you combine that prior distribution with what you actually get to observe. And these two pieces of information will actually get you the update, the updated evidence, your updated view on the state of nature. And your decisions, your inference is going to be based on this updated or posterior distribution. So the methods that uh, we have included in EAST utilize this approach. Well, the first one is the continual reassessment method, uh, which was developed by Quigley et al. Um, it also uses all the available information from doses uh, to guide the dose assignment. A user would have to specify, again, the target toxicity level, typically 30 33%. But they will also have to specify a function that describes this dose toxicity relationship. And typically, that function is a single parameter uh, function. And that single parameter has to have a prior distribution. So depending on the form of that single parameter relationship, whether it's a logistic or whether it's a, um, a power function or a hyperbolic tangent, there are different prior distributions that can be used to ease the computations. So there is a log normal prior distribution for the logistic case and gamma distributions 
non-informative or informative to, an, to a sense that can be used in, this, in the case of the power uh, model. Uh, so the way that the algorithm would work is that you treat subjects at the each dose level, you observe how many toxicities you have, and then you utilize the prior information that you have, the prior distribution, along with the number of toxicities that you have observed. You combine these, and you're able to calculate the probability of toxicity at each dose level that you have. Actually, the average probability of toxicity at each dose level uh, from, with respect to that posterior distribution. So the next cohort of subjects <coughs> is going to be assigned at the dose level that has this average probability of P sub i being closest to the target toxicity that you have set. And the algorithm will work like this, will we'll crunch through until you either meet the maximum sample size or some sort of a uh, stopping rule that you have uh, set uh, a priori. Now you can imagine that if you have this model guiding your decision, there may be, there may easily be a case where uh, the model might say, well, the, the next, uh, the dose level that has as its mean posterior probability of toxicity being close to the target level could be a dose level that is maybe twice or three times or down the road, quite a bit down the road from your current dose level. Uh, so you may skip doses uh, easily. And actually, typically, this is what happens. And this is something that clinicians do not find very appealing. They find it pretty risky. So um, the authors of the CRM, as, as well as other authors, took um, notice of this. And they have created some modifications. So you may not allow for uh, skipping uh, dose levels. Um, <clears throat> You may not uh, 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 escalate once you have seen a certain number of toxicities and so forth like that. So there is a number of modifications. And they have also shown that um, the uh, performance of the algorithm does not is not affected by much by importing these modifications into the software. So this is actually the default method that we have also incorporated uh, into EAST. Uh, the one thing that this method lacks is um, the utilization of the posterior variance. Because the decisions are being made based on the probability of toxicity a posteriori, the mean probability of toxicity at each dose level. So here's a case of two distributions that have, on average, the same probability of toxicity, around 30%. OK, so they would yield the same decision based on the CRM. However, the first one, the red curve here, has a post probability of uh, toxicity above um, 0.6 being pretty negligible. You can see that the area above 0.6 is very small. It's around 0 0.002. With the second scenario, the blue curve, which is also centered around 30%, so it would yield the same average probability of toxicity at that dose level, the chance of going above 60% in terms of toxicity is much higher. You can see that the tail area here is is fatter. So it's about 17%. So the CRM tends to ignore that. Um, and that's why um, uh, a group of researchers uh, at Novartis, uh, Bert Neuschwander and uh, his colleagues, came up with this updated method of uh, the Bayesian logistic regression model, where they now utilize a two-parameter dose toxicity curve. And instead of basing the dose escalation uh, decision based on how close the, the posterior probability of toxicity on average is to the target toxicity level, they have devised the concept of toxicity probability intervals. So they have an interval of targeted toxicity, which they want to maximize, and maximize the, the chance of being into their interval. And they also have defined intervals of underdosing, excessive toxicity, or, or, or unacceptable toxicity. And the last two can actually be collapsed into one interval of overdosing, if you wish. And then the way that you would uh, move to the next dose level could either be based on a purely Bayesian fashion, which would uh, maximize uh, the expected utility or minimize the posterior expected loss. Again, so you'd have to enter a loss function, loss structure in there, which may not be trivial. Or the one that's most widely used is they impose a, constra a constraint on the overdosing. And they say that the chance that you fall in either of these two intervals should be capped at, say, 25%. Uh, 
And subject to that constraint, then what we'll try to do is to maximize the probability of falling into the targeted toxicity interval. So this is the escalation with overdosing control uh, method. So they use this method to drive uh, the dose escalation. So the dose level that will actually achieve this maximum uh, targeted toxicity subject to the constraint of overdosing is the one that's going to be next uh, recommended. But of course, here we have a two-parameter logistic regression function. There are other things that have to be considered. Uh, so you don't have a single prior distribution. You have a bivariate prior distribution for these parameters. Typically, this is a bivariate normal distribution. And there is no easy way of entering directly the parameters, the a priori parameters for this bivariate normal distribution. So there are, they have been developed different indirect ways of entering it. So you can elicit, for example, information from the clinician uh, or your team on what their best guess of the probability of toxicity at the lowest dose level is going to be and what their best guess at the MTD is going to be. Then this information can be used to essentially crunch out and bring um, a, the best guess for this prior distribution. Okay? This is a method uh, which has been developed within Roche by Hasson and Kinnersley, uh, and we have utilized that. Uh, Neus van der Rohe also gives sort of like different ways of trying to elicit uh, information on different spaces, on the predictive probability space, to try and model that back to uh, a prior distribution. So that um, should not be, again, um, a concern. In terms of the estimation, since now the the inference is going to be based on the posterior distribution, and the posterior distribution is not a trivial distribution, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods have to be employed. So you can either use the metropolis hastings algorithm, or you can use a direct sampling method which was developed internally uh, within Cytel for a different product to sample for a fro from a four-parameter logistic function. And so with a two-parameter, it works uh, actually even better. So, Besides these model-based methods, we have also offered what is called the, the hybrid method, uh, which is the modified toxicity probability interval approach, uh, which is Bayesian like the CRM and the BLRM, uh, but it also utilizes sort of like this rule-based um, decision-making, um, like the 3 plus 3 design. It makes it slightly more appealing to clinicians. Um, this was developed by Zhi Liu uh, et al. Um, it was a combination of uh, researchers at uh, MD Anderson and Merck. Um, and there were also uh, modifications of this uh, uh, approach, which in some reincarnation also involved as an author, Su Jay Wang uh, of the FDA. So it is a method that has also uh, caught the eye uh, of the regulators. The idea behind it is to be able to show the clinician something like this in Excel, probably. So you might show a clinician, well, here's a trial monitoring table. So if you have 12 subjects in this column and you observe, for example, six toxicities, then your decision would be to de-escalate. Or if you observe five toxicities, the decision would be to stay at the current dose. Or if you're, you observe seven toxicities, the decision would be to de-escalate and never visit that dose level again declare that as unacceptable. So if you're able to present a clinician something like this, then this will be pretty appealing um, in terms of uh, implementing it uh, in a design, in a trial. Uh, and the way that you're actually able to arrive into something like this, um, it's pretty familiar. So much like uh, the Neuschwander approach, they are using, they have defined three intervals, the interval of targeted toxicity, which is appropriate, uh, they call it proper dosing, which is associated with the decision to stay at the current dose, an interval of underdosing, which is associated with the decision to escalate, an interval of overdosing, which is associated with the decision to de-escalate. And the way that you would use this approach is that uh, you, would, um, um, you would, again, expose subjects, um, uh, cohorts of subjects at this dose level, the probability of toxicity uh, would be assumed to be a, a, ga a, a beta distribution with 1, 1. And you would calculate the posterior probability of each one of these three intervals. Okay? But not, 
base the decision just on the posterior probability, but base it on a normalized version of the posterior probability. So you would calculate the posterior probability of the uh, proper dosing, the underdosing and the overdosing interval, divide that by the length of the interval, and call that the unit probability mass. The interval that has the highest unit probability mass is the interval that, it's the interval that will lead you to the associated decision. So if this interval, for example, the middle interval, the proper dosing interval has the highest unit probability mass, then the decision associated with it, which is stay, would be the decision for the next cohort. Ne so um, as a result, if, you, uh, if the overdosing interval is the, this is the interval with the highest unit probability mass, the inter interval associated with that, which is de-escalate, uh, would be used. So, uh, and this would also, you would have to em employ in each one of these methods uh, that we mentioned some sort of a stopping uh, criterion, which uh, I will illustrate uh, in the software uh, in the next few minutes. The new thing that we have added is dealing with combination trials. I think uh, Adrian did a pretty good job of trying to motivate you why you would want uh, to use combination trials. So I'm actually going to skip this um, and this. So we don't actually need to know why do we want to use combination therapies. But this is something that has been uh, uh, established up to this point. Um, from our point of view, within EAST, we have tried to implement, and we've implemented two methods in the upcoming uh, version of the software. The first one uh, is based on uh, the extension of the BLRM method uh, by Neusch van der Rohe, which was published into Statistical Methods Drunk Combination uh, Studies, which we call, at least for the moment, the name of it is COMP to BLRM. And the second one is the method that Adrian and Michael Sweeting created, um, which is the PIPE method. So we try to implement both of these things into EAST, and we try to bring them under sort of like the same umbrella. So the general approach that you can think about is that you specify an initial dose combination for the first cohort, uh, X, A, and B for the different agents. You would record the observed number of toxicities. Then given a parametric dose toxicity model uh, with priors on the parameter vector theta, um, you would update the inference to obtain a new posterior distribution. So in the case um, of pipe, this we're talking about binomial and beta, which would yield to an updated beta distribution. In the case of uh, the, uh, the bivariate BLRM, um, we are talking about extensions of this bivariate logistic regression model, which I'm going to be uh, talking about in a little bit. And then you choose the next dose combination based on a set of admissible dose combinations, closest doses, as the one that uh, Adrian mentioned before. And in the case of the BLRM, the dose levels that are subject to this overdosing constraint. You don't want the probability of overdosing to be above 25%. And then the decision rule to choose between the doses that are admissible using the posterior distribution. Okay. So, and then you would continue recruiting over patients either until a fixed sample size is obtained, uh, like in the case of PIPE, or a stopping rule has been uh, satisfied. So this is sort of like the general umbrella uh, for the both approaches. For the BLRM approach, we are essentially utilizing the BLRM model for each one of the two agents. And then we also have an interaction term, which is modeled by a normal distribution. Uh, so this kind of uh, draws from the methodology of Tho uh, in his uh, treatment uh, that, um, of uh, combination agents that Adrian mentioned as well, where uh, he essentially looks at the odds uh, of a DLT, um, and he writes uh, the odds in terms of um, the, the first dose agent, a function of the second dose agent, and an interaction term. And if you write it in terms of the odds, this gets simplified in this fashion, and you can just um, extract the distribution of the prior distribution for the interaction, enter that into the mix, and then proceed as you would do in the BLRM, okay? By calculating the posterior distribution and the chance of falling into the targeted toxicity interval subject to the overdosing uh, constraint. With uh, PIPE, actually, well, Adrian has already done most of the job. So here I'm just going to uh, highlight that we have a high a target uh, MTD cont contour or the MTC that is mentioned, mentioned in, the, uh, in his paper with Michael. 
uh, there's an a priori and a posteriori probability of toxicity at uh, a specific dose uh, combination, which is a beta distribution uh, due to the conjugacy uh, um, of the beta distribution to the binomial. Uh, so it's easy to calculate the posterior probability of toxicity at each dose level. Uh, the maximum tolerated contour needs to satisfy the monotonicity assumption to drive dose escalation, as he mentioned. And then the next dose combination is chosen from a set of admissible doses that are close uh, to the maximum tolerated contour. And this is, I think, the example that uh, Adrian mentioned uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his presentation, where you, you, this could be a realization that you might have, which if you convert it into this uh, bivariate, into this binary case, you would translate the, doc, the, the dose levels that are above the contour as one, the dose levels that are be below the contour uh, as zero, and then uh, you would move forward uh, like this. So the pro process would be to dose a new cohort of subjects on the best combination, record the number of DLTs. For each dose day combination, in his example, uh, calculate the posterior DLT probability, and then calculate the probability of being above uh, the target toxicity level average over the contour distribution for safety and use the most likely contour for uh, decision making. So these um, methods are the ones that we have uh, implemented uh, into the software as well. Uh, and they are all reside under our discrete uh, models. So for those of you who have attended uh, different talks, you, can see, you will see that um, the first four models are pretty much uh, the same uh, that we have utilized before, like for example, the, the Bayesian logistic regression model is here. Let me just move this around so we save some space. And um, so in a BLRM case, you would set what the maximum sample size is. You can actually explore multiple maximum sample sizes. That's what the pink cell is about. And you can try an experiment with different cohort sizes. You have the target probability of toxicity, which needs to reside within the targeted toxicity interval. And you need to specify whether you want to use the escalation with overdose control, the one that maximizes the probability of falling into the target, or the base risk approach, which will bring up a new column for you to set what your loss function uh, is going to be. Uh, and then, in terms of the prior distribution, you, you don't have to set the prior directly into the two parameters, but you can actually elicit that prior distribution. So you can elicit the, the example that I, oops, that I mentioned in the, the slides, where you can elicit from the clinicians the, their best guess at the probability of the lowest dose level, uh, of DLT at the lowest dose level, and that the best guess at the MTD. And that would be translated into a prior distribution. Or you can elicit information in, uh, of this sort, for example, the lowest dose and the highest dose in terms of defining quantiles of the probability of toxicity for these dose levels. So you can, for example, have the probability of toxicity at the lowest dose level, the probability of that being below 0.4 is high. How high? 90%. And the probability that the highest dose level is below 0.2 happens too rarely, so 0.05. If you, have, if you have these pieces of information, then again, uh, these can be uh, plugged in into our calculator and be translated into uh, a bivariate uh, prior distribution. So all of our models have the same structure, all of our designs have the same structure, where you enter the basic design parameters in the first tab. You would then have to enter the stopping rules into the second tab. Uh, and stopping rules would have to be, uh, for example, um, if your highest dose level is before, below the target too often, then stop. Or if the probability of toxicity um, is so what is called the target rule, which is also used by Noish van der Rohe, if the probability of target toxicity is above 0.5, then again you stop. You can actually select um, any one of these stopping rules on its own, or you can actually combine stopping rules. So you can actually take the target rule and the overdosing rule, and you can have more, one or two of them uh, added at the same time. So the stopping rules is the second tab. The third tab is the one where you actually get to run this, um, the method 
on different reality scenarios. So these are different scenarios. So typically what you want to do is you want to create a scenario where the MTD is on the, on the low dose range, and MTD is on the middle dose range, and MTD is on the high dose range, and then see how good the software is in terms of picking up the real MTD, how often with how many subjects um, being disposed and how many toxicities being observed on average. And the final is the simulation control, which actually tells you how many simulations uh, you want to be running. So this is one way uh, of running the software, which is in the simulation-based approach. So by, by using just these default values and something which is very quick, uh, I can simulate this and um, you can get an idea of uh, what sort of like output you get. But then the second way of running the software is the actual trial running example, where you actually get together with the team and uh, you observe the number of toxicities for each cohort uh, of subjects. So this is the, let me maximize this. So this was the output of the simulation. Let me just save it into our uh, design, into our um, uh, library, and within that, you can actually explore different things about the simulation. So you can explore the dose limiting toxicity, how many subjects you ended up exposing at each dose level, and how many MTDs you got to see, uh, what was the MTD, and how often was it picked, um, and then how well it fit the model that you have, um, and then you can get the interval probabilities for those uh, toxicity, targeted toxicity, the underdosing and the overdosing uh, by dose for each simulation that you ended up running, which is actually one of the most useful displays that you can see because that actually tells you why you ended up picking the dose that you picked. Um, because if you remember, we want the probability of overdosing to be below 25%. So automatically these four are discarded because they're pretty high. This is the one that has a probability of toxicity below 20%. So among these three, you're going to be picking the one that has the chance, the highest chance of falling in the target toxicity. So the highest green area is the one being picked. So dose level 15 would be the one that's being picked in this simulation scenario. And this is something that you can actually bring to the clinicians. Because when you're actually running the trial um, and you have, for example, uh, zero toxicities uh, out of three when you enter the interim data at your first dose level, then you're going to be able to show the clinicians why this decision was being taken. And this is actually the, the, what we call a, a communication tool. Like most of the, all of the methods that we offer are most of a communication tool. Because you're not going to be blindly trusting the software to guide you through the dose escalation. But the clinicians will take this as a suggestion. And they will bring other matters uh, into the table, and then you're going to be deciding on whether or not you want to adhere to the recommendation of the software. And you will actually have a chance to adhere. Because here, for example, it tells you that you're going to be skipping a dose level. You may not want to skip a dose level and say, well, I want to actually play it safe. So I want to try the next sub cohort of subjects on dose level 10. And you can go on uh, with, uh, with this method. So um, tomorrow. Um, and this is a shameless plug for tomorrow's um, uh, workshop. Uh, we're going to be going through some exercises of these methods. We're going to be seeing these methods along, along with the bivariate methods and the different types of outputs uh, that you observe in more detail. And those of you who will be participating will actually get to get their hands dirty uh, with uh, the software. And uh, that's why in, during the breaks, if you can, for those of you who are going to be here, uh, let's just get together and like, make sure that you have access to the Citrix environment where the software resides so that we, we won't have to fiddle with this um, kind of uh, uh, matters tomorrow uh, and utilize most of the time for uh, the exercises. So in conclusion, uh, there are different methods, both rule-based and model-based approaches, as well as hybrids. Some of the Model-based methods like the BLRM are used ex exclusively by some companies, like, for example, Novartis. Merck uses exclusively the MTPI method, uh, the MSD. 
Uh, and we provide all these methods in two modes. So there is a simulation mode that allows you to evaluate the operating characteristics of the design and see how well it performs. And there is the interim monitoring mode, which allows you to actually run the trial and bring this to the table as a communication tool and make the decisions together with your uh, clinical team. And with that, I would leave you for the break. And I would also take any questions that you might have either now or later.